like Three Mile Island. Any of you remember the pre-Japan, that was the last nuclear meltdown. And they looked at me and said, oh, because it is Three Mile Island. I said, what the hell are we doing here? But we now own some shopping centers nearby to Three Mile Island. But uh, we were going around touring some space, and we saw one of the shopping centers they were showing us, and uh, there was a big sign for lease in one of the windows. And the head of leasing for uh, Cedar Reed uh, was asked by Jeff, and I was sitting right in front of him, uh, well, you know, what are you doing about that store? Oh, we, are you kidding? It's an opportunity. We have this tenant, and we have that tenant. And, you know, it's just a question of which one we pick. And Jeff looked at her, and he said, Oh, I see things are the same here. You learn how to lie with a straight face fast. And she almost fell out of her seat. She was laughing so hard because she was lying. She had no, no prospects either. But um, <laughs> it did subsequently get rented. But uh, you also have to learn with leasing people when they're lying. Hopefully, you know, not to the people they work for too often. Going back to your law, um, law career, here, I'd like you to name a not name a client that you had and what you learned not, what not to do from that client? Well, other than Jerry Sprackman's over leverage, and I, and I got to tell you how he did it. It was really cool. Did you lend him money, Paul? You probably, everybody did. National he, Bank. He, he, uh, the, the, the two things I learned from him, I already named him, that what not to do is number one, don't forget about the last 10% of the center. I mean, you guys have heard me for many years saying, you haven't finished till the last 10% is leased because, and you know what, whether it's a center, it's a condo building, it's an office building, it's almost anything. Your, your profit is usually in that last 10 or 15% of the, of the property. And, you know, everybody, especially when times are good, everybody's so anxious to get to the next deal and they lose focus. Um, one of the things we do at Recan, quite frankly, uh, not as intensely as we used to do because we've just gotten too big, is we meet every Tuesday morning and we go through and everybody gets their turn on the hot seat. Uh, and we actually look at individual properties and say, you know, how much vacant space we got left and what's being done about it. That's usually when the lies start, but no, I'm just kidding. Fiction. I shouldn't call them lies. Fiction. That, that's not true. But you, you've got to focus on that last 15%. And the other thing is you just can't keep levering. You really do need some equity. You need some money that you don't have to pay back at a given time uh, because no deal ever finishes. I, mean, I shouldn't say that. Some do. Most deals take longer than you ever expect. If you figure it's going to take two years, figure three, and, uh, and finance for that, that extra period of time. Jerry never did that. And that's, that's so when the slightest ill wind fell or, you know, blew, the cards fell down, and everything, that was the other thing I learned, don't cross-collateralize. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry was a master of cross-collateral. Oh, yeah, I got that deal's almost finished. You take it as security for my land purchase here. It didn't work out well too well. Um, so, you know, an aversion to debt, and uh, with all due deference to our uh, one of our main sponsors here, uh, I learned to mistrust banks, to be very honest. I sit on the board of a bank. And I, I, it's, it's a terrible thing to say, but, uh, you know, there, there's that old uh, uh, cliche that bankers will give you an umbrella when the sun is shining, and when it starts raining, they take it away. And um, it's not as true, perhaps, as it used to be. Relationships really do matter in Canada. And, and our balance sheet. I'm not talking about Recan anymore. No, but that's why <laughs> that's not so true anymore. No, it's not, certainly not true for us. But I think it's, it's, it's uh, less true in general in, in Canadian because, you know, there was such a shakeout over, you know, in the early 90s that everybody learned a lot of lessons. And I, I think one of the reasons, quite frankly, that our banking system came through the way it did, there were a lot of reasons, but one of them was that Canadian bankers really never forgot the lessons of the early 90s and, uh, and either did most developers that... that you know, can remember that far back. I mean, it's hard to think that it was almost 20 years ago. Uh, but, um, you know, what happened to the financial system in 08 and 09 was terrible for the financial system. But as far as its impact on real estate, it was like a walk in the park compared to the, uh, the early 90s. And, uh, you know, that, that's probably where I learned the most lessons. And, uh, you know, uh, listen, I... I won't name a, a client, to go back to your question, 
but I learned, you know what? You gotta, you gotta be honest. You gotta tell the <laughs> truth. Uh, because you know, it's one thing. I make jokes about lying about leasing and tenants, and that is a joke. But when you're not straightforward with your lender, your partner, your buyer, your tenant, it's gonna get you. It's gonna get you sooner or later. I mean, I used to run across clients, and uh, you know, they'd come in and they'd done their deal with the bank, and I go, "Well, you've already pledged that asset." And I said, well, y y y they won't know. I said, what do you mean they won't know? <laughs> he said, well, the time they figure it out, all the and you know what? You always eventually get caught. You might keep the balls up in the air for a little while, and you might get away with one or two, but sooner or later, uh, you can't build a company that way. You build a company by being straightforward with people, even if the facts aren't, you know they're not going to like them. Integrity. You, you, you have to have it. It's what... The guys who have been around for a long time, you know, and I'm not just talking about uh, us at Riacan, There's, we all know who they are. Um, you can take their word for something. They will not lie to you. They won't mislead you. Um, and, you know, it's just not worth it for anybody, not if you want to be around for a while. So you leave a great law practice. You get into a couple of good... That's so good. <laughs> was We're not going to get into it that. It was pretty good. Uh, okay, you leave a, a, a fine law practice. Right. Uh, you get into, uh, into the trust business for a while. The early 90s happen, and out of that comes uh, your vision of RIACAN. And RIACAN starts off as a multifaceted uh, organization in terms of the type of real estate. For those who don't understand, Rio has nothing to do with Brazil, but it's retail industrial office. In Canada. In Canada. So none of them are true anymore. <laughs> so what, what, what was the transformation to be actually become an expert in retail and get out of those other facets? Uh, how did that transpire? Uh, that's, that's, that's a very good question, Freddie. Um, you know, when I left law, it was 1987. I'm not sure I would have left if I would have known that the economy was going to give me exactly two good years. And then the, the world was going to cave in on my head, but sometimes... Uh, as I think it did, and certainly in my case, they work out for the best. If, if I would have known, I might have not left law, and who knows what would have happened. Um, but uh, when we started RECAN, and again, you know, I talked a little bit about the early 90s, and you get anybody of my vintage, or even Fred's much younger vintage, they'll tell you the early 90s was, it was a forming time. It really was a fire. Um, you know, to just, I'll just tell one little story about how bad it was. I was walking up Bay Street or down Bay Street, and I walked, ran into a guy named Jim Bullock. And at the time, Jim Bullock was CEO of Cadillac Fairview Corporation, which was, in its own way, it wasn't owned by a pension fund yet. It was a big public company, and it was big. It was one of the two or three, maybe if not the, sort of top public real estate corporation in Canada. And uh, I knew Jim, and Jim said, Eddie, how are you? I said, how should I be? I said, I think we're going to go broke any time now. I said, I, you know, I, I spend all my time, it was probably 1992, spend all my time talking to bankers, doing workouts. I said, somehow I'm a special guy. The only bankers that talk to me are in special loans. So it's, you know, I'm special. And uh, I said, it's not, a, you know, it's not a lot of fun. You know, if it's not the bankers I'm talking to, it's some tenant who can't pay their rent. I mean, it's just, everything's no good. It's, it's trouble. I said, I know you don't understand that because, your CEO of Cadillac Fairview. And his comment back to me, he says, don't kid yourself. He says, we are all on a conveyor belt. He said, in the conveyor belt, there's a big fire called bankruptcy. He says, the only difference between you and me, and Eddie, you and me, Eddie, is our relative position on that conveyor belt. Funny thing was, we never did go broke. He did. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's another story. Um, but once we established RIACAN and really were forming it in 1994, uh, we turned what was a little uh, real estate mutual fund, which we had to suspend redemptions on. And I used to, at, at our annual meeting yesterday, I had some very nice elderly gentleman come up to me. He says, Scottish accent. He says, he says, you know, I remember going to meetings in 1993. He says, you were dodging fruit, Mr. Sunshine. I said, yeah, that's true. I, any meeting I didn't get hit by something, I was happy uh, because these people had had their redemptions frozen. They couldn't get their money uh, for almost two years, 1992 and 90, and into 93. And I came to them at the end of 1993 and I said, look, we got two choices. There's only two things to do. 
we can just sell the assets of this mutual fund and whatever you get, you get, and we'll divvy up the money and that'll be the end of the day. And actually I had an opinion of value from uh, CIBC uh, as to what it would be worth. And I said, or we can try this new thing that they've started to do in Australia and they've started to do in the United States and it's called a real estate investment trust because they did not exist in Canada in 1993. There wasn't even a legislative framework. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'll get to your question. Um, Feels like Tuesday morning. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm sorry. It's true. I tend to pontificate. The, every year I get older, I pontificate more. But anyway, it, um, I try not to, but I don't always succeed. Um, the... Uh, and, you know, I'll make it short. I won. They agreed to try a REIT. We took a public in January 94. And over the course of 94, we were really trying to figure out what, do, what, what to do with this company that we now had and how we could make it work. We went public at uh, $12. We raised $23 million in March of 1994 through the good offices of CIBC. Uh, and then the window shut very quickly. And um, so we had this one pot of money, we had a mixed bag of assets that maybe were 90 or $100 million in value on a good day. And uh, we figured, what do we do from here? So over the course of 94, I really had nothing much else to do except to figure out strategy and what to do and what to focus on. And it was really all about risk aversion. Because again, you know, the, <laughs> I'll tell you a joke, uh, a very, very short one. The joke in 1993 and 94, they used to go around on faxes, if anybody remembers those, because we didn't have emails yet, believe it or not, um, was twofold. Uh, if you don't like your children, get even with them, leave them your real estate. That's what people thought of real estate. And the second one was, oh God, let there be one more boom, and this time I promise I won't piss it away. Because everybody had lost everything. So there was a serious risk aversion. When I used to go in and talk to people, about uh, investing in, in uh, RIACAN, and uh, they'll give us their money, we'll go buy real estate with it. They'd look at me like I you know, had, I don't know, three horns. But uh, it was a tough sell. So I really had to structure RIACAN to be as risk averse as it could be. And in looking at the three formats of real estate that our name indicated, retail, industrial, office, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if you could get, in retail what you got was number one, covenant leases. You got retailers who were largely national in scope. That was something we uh, focused on from day one. Today, I think uh, our overall portfolio is about 86 point something percent national tenants. You got long-lived leases. Um, you know, again, I don't know what our average in let's say our top 10 is, but it's probably eight or nine years remaining. We signed 10, 15, 20 year leases with, uh, unless you're Target, in which case it's 60 years, um, you know, with, with the large tenants. So you have a certainty of cash flow from a quality covenant tenant. You also have the, I think, the biggest difference between the three formats. A retail location for a tenant is a profit center. Your tenant is there to make money. And as long as he's making money and doing well in that store, he's afraid to move to the other side of the street, never mind to move two blocks away. If you're an office tenant who wants to be in downtown Toronto, pick an example, there's 20 buildings that are all suitable. They're on the path, they're decent buildings, you go in any one of them. It becomes a cost exercise, because, and same with industrial. So in industrial or office space, to, to the tenant, it's a cost of doing business. It's a cost center. To a retailer, it's a profit center. 